What I thought I would do uh, for today's chat is go into the idea of our preposterous universe, the title of this lecture. Uh, of course, I use this as a title for all sorts of things because it's a fun, catchy phrase, but I don't always explain why we're calling it our preposterous universe. After all, it's the universe, right? How preposterous can it be? And the word preposterous in this case manages to bring up some idea that somehow the universe doesn't make sense to us. The universe is strange or surprising. In one way, that's just perfectly obvious. That's always going to be true. In science, we try our best to understand the universe, but it takes time. We're usually not all the way there. We work toward it. We think we understand more and more, but at any one moment, scientists throughout the world are concentrating on the questions that they don't know the answer to. So the fact that the world surprises us or confuses us is not quite enough. The phrase our preposterous universe indicates that we're in a situation where there are things about our universe that we think we should understand, that we have an expectation for, and yet the universe is not quite doing what we might expect. This is something that really became, uh, for me personally, into focus in the late 1990s. And I want to go through exactly why I'm thinking this and how it puts us in a situation in physics today. It's a very special situation we're in, one that is sort of a crisis slash opportunity kind of mode, where there are things we don't understand. Maybe we can be motivated by this lack of understanding to really move forward in some interesting ways. So. Put yourselves in the frame of mind of me 20 some years ago when I was in graduate school, right? Uh, when we were, when I was just learning about what our universe was all about. Sadly, it's more than 20 some years ago now, but you know what I mean. Um, the late 1980s, early 1990s was an interesting time in physics, in cosmology, in gravity, but it became much more interesting very rapidly. And the reason why it's interesting is because by that point, we had already basically put together what we call standard models of different areas of physics. And there's all sorts of interesting areas of physics that I'm not an expert on and won't try to talk about, but let me mention three that I think are very relevant here. Cosmology, the study of the whole universe all at once. Particle physics, or what we sometimes call high energy physics, the study of the very, very small, the fundamental constituents of nature. And of course, gravity, right? Which Einstein taught us is the curvature of space time. The point I want to try to make is that in all three of these cases, in cosmology, particle physics, and gravity, we have what we call standard models, by which we mean theories that fit the data, okay? That there is really no, aside from some tiny little quibbles, there's essentially no experiment that cannot be fit into the framework of these theories. That's the good news. The bad news is that we know these theories aren't right. We know these theories are not the final answer to what we're thinking about in terms of how nature works. So that's a very strange situation. Progress in science is usually driven by the fact that we have a theory that predicts one thing and we go out and measure or do an observation and it says something else. Here we have a theory that fits all the data we can uh, collect, but we have reasons internal to the theory to think that they're not complete, to think there's something extra going on. So I want to dig into that a little bit and explain why we think that. So let's start with cosmology, okay? This is what I did for a living for uh, much of my career. The study of the universe as a whole, the standard model in cosmology is the Big Bang model, okay? We use the phrase Big Bang, like many phrases in physics, in inconsistent ways. Sometimes the phrase the Big Bang means simply the first moment in the history of the universe, a moment about 14 billion years ago when things were ex incredibly hot, incredibly dense, and rapidly expanding for the first time. There's already a lot of confusions and myths just about that, okay? Number one, we don't actually know whether that Big Bang was the beginning of the universe or not. Maybe it was, but the equations that we have, which have to do with gravity and general relativity, which we'll get to later, but they're not up to the task. They actually just break down. There's a simple interpretation of those equations that says the universe begins at the Big Bang. It's not a point in space, not an explosion in a pre-existing space. It's the first moment of time. It's the day before which there were no other days. But that interpretation might be wrong. It's completely possible that there was time before the Big Bang, that there was some universe, some space and some time that pre-existed what we call the Big Bang. So that's one of the puzzles that we're stuck with. 
Another is the other way that we use the phrase the Big Bang is what we call the Big Bang model, which is an entire story of the history of the universe in the last 14 billion years, from the Big Bang to today. The story of the universe is expanding, cooling, stars and galaxies forming, the universe lighting up and giving us the image that we see in the night sky today. If you go out into that night sky, imagine that you could see the night sky and you had perfect vision, right? So the Hubble Space Telescope was glued to your eyeball. You could see very, very distant objects. You could even measure how fast they're moving away from you. What do you see? You see a universe that is full of galaxies. Galaxies have of order 100 billion or a trillion stars per galaxy. And we have of order a trillion galaxies in the universe. And they're spread out more or less uniformly. If you run the movie backwards, the universe was hotter, denser, and smoother in the past. So the story of this Big Bang model is one in which gravity, as the universe expands and dilutes, gravity pulls things together. It turns up the contrast knob on the universe. Galaxies form in overdense regions, space empties out in between them, and we go from a relatively smooth plasma to this lumpy universe that we see today. Again, this is a story that fits the data. It fits it spectacularly. We can go all the way back to one second after the Big Bang, and we can make empirical predictions, test them against the data, and they come out correct. But you're allowed to ask, why is it like that? Why is the universe smooth? Why did it start out hot and dense? It was actually Roger Penrose, who was one of the real thinkers behind the Big Bang theory back in the 1960s and 70s, who was the first to really emphasize that the Big Bang is a preposterous setup in a very simple way. You could ask yourself, given all these atoms, given all these particles in the universe that you see, if you arrange these particles in different ways, whether or not they're spread out or whether or not they're clumped together, you can say, what would a typical arrangement of this stuff look like, right? What would you expect? If you just took a bunch of particles, there's something like 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe. Okay, so take 10 to the 80, 80th atoms, put them in a bag, arrange them randomly, open the bag and see what they look like, okay? The answer is they don't look anything like the universe that we see. This is a story of entropy. Entropy counts how likely or how disorderly something is. The early universe should have if we just picked it randomly, be wildly, wildly lumpy, should be inhomogeneous, as cosmologists would say. A universe that is extremely smooth at those early times is extremely, extremely, extremely unlikely. Why is that? Penrose asks this question. Why did the universe start out so special, so preposterous from our point of view? Now, Alan Guth and others suggested an answer to this called the inflationary universe model. If the universe starts out very tiny and dominated by a kind of super dense energy, it can push everything apart while smoothing things out. This is called the inflationary universe scenario or the inflationary paradigm. And it successfully explains why the universe is smooth today but only at the cost of saying, let's imagine that the universe starts out very smooth and dense and dominated by this crazy kind of energy. And you can do the same calculation that Penrose did, but just plug in crazy amounts of energy that are very small and hot and dense. And it's even lower entropy than the universe we started with. In other words, it's even more finely tuned, special, non-generic. So inflation explains why our universe looks preposterous by saying, well, what if it started out looking even more preposterous Then it would naturally grow into the universe that we see? So this is not quite sufficient. It's not that inflation is wrong. We don't know whether inflation is right or not, but it's not complete. The story itself undermines itself by not playing by its own rules. All that inflation was supposed to do was tell us why the universe looked natural, and it does so in a very unnatural way. So that's something we have to deal with.